Okay, thanks, Danny, for that. Can you see that? Or do I, does that look okay? Somebody say yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great. Hey, well, some people have called, you know, Romans the greatest book in the Bible, and other people have said the greatest chapter in the greatest book of the Bible is, is Romans chapter 8. Uh, it's probably the greatest chapter that's ever been written about the Christian life. And so tonight, what I wanted to do is just look at the first two verses, Romans 8, 1 and 2. And uh, one of the things that when I've studied uh, Bible study methods, they talk about what's called the law, law of correlation. And the law of correlation, it's a principle of interpretation of, of the Bible. So it, it, the, the law basically says this, that, and this, was a, this is a very old theological uh, comment. I mean, I, I learned this my first year in seminary. Scripture interprets Scripture. And the Scripture itself is the best interpreter of Scripture. And the best way to understand one verse means it sometimes is to look at other verses and let those other verses clarify what that right. verse means. You also exactly. interpret... Is somebody talking? No, I just said exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Sorry. Yeah. We hear the background, so maybe if everybody could put on mute for now, and then we'll come back for, for put it on for other things. So anyway, the other, the other thing about this is you also interpret a difficult passage in light of a clear passage. And so tonight, what I want to do is try to use the law of correlation and apply it to these two verses that, that, that are on your screen here. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin. So um, I think one of the most important verses in the Christian life that you could that you could read, that you could memorize, that you could meditate on would be uh, just uh, it, just Romans 8, 1 and 2. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. So I guess the first question would be, well, what is condemnation? And I think when, when we think about it, usually the way we think about it is by how we feel. Uh, if you, you, you can describe it this way, I feel guilty. In other words, you know you did wrong. You have that kind of self-condemnation. You're on death row. Uh, you're, uh, I'm just gonna make sure we got everybody on mute here. Okay. Um, now I'll go back to sharing the screen. Uh, it's kind of, you, you know, if you were a kid, you got your hand caught in the cookie jar uh, and you felt guilty uh, as you looked over and there was your mom. Uh, sometimes you feel fear, you fear punishment. Uh, you know, not only am I guilty, but I'm going to get it. You know, that old line, wait till your father gets home. Something I have done wrong and I'm going to get condemned for it. Or you might feel self-rejection. I was such an idiot. I blew it. Oh, I made such a bad mistake. You know, uh, the Bible says that God doesn't want Christians to live under those feelings of fear and guilt and self-condemnation and rejection. Now, if you look back at Romans 7 about the struggle that Paul went through, look at verse 15 there. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, it sounds like Abbott and Costello, doesn't it? I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that God, good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my, my inner being, I delight in God's law, 
but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Now here's verse, verse 24, it becomes uh, interesting. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Now, one of the things that I hope you realize is that in the, in the Bible, uh, in, when it was originally written, the, these, these, uh, the letter to Rome, there were no chapter divisions in, in the original writings. So chapter 8, 1 and 2 is, is responding to chapter 7. He's talking about a Christian who's struggling here. A Christian who's struggling, he says, is not under condemnation. So what does that mean? When a Christian sins, what happens? And I think if we don't understand this, what we're going to do is we're going to avoid God out of fear. We're going to find it hard to feel close to him most of the time if we're feeling under condemnation. So let, let's look at a couple things real quickly. First of all, God does not reject me when I sin. You know, uh, Jesus speaking here in uh, John 6, uh, 37, he says, uh, by the way, if you're a Christian, you, you, you've given your life to Christ. Uh, God is never going to reject you after that. He says, all that the all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Now, never is an interesting word. God will never, one translation says, he will never cast you out. He will never reject you once you are in Christ. So a Christian doesn't have to worry about God kicking them out of the family. You don't have to worry about losing your salvation. God doesn't write you off. He still loves you, and he still accepts you even when you sin. And why does he do that? Well, first of all, because his love is unconditional. You know, the idea that maybe you've heard this when you're a kid, you better be good or God won't like you, that is not in Scripture. That's a nice guilt-manipulating technique. And if you're a believer, God has already accepted you, and he cannot reject you. You are in Christ, and to reject you would be to reject Christ. Uh Look at uh, Romans 9. Uh, uh, you know what? 9.15, yeah. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And I think he's saying there that my love for you is not dependent on how you react to it. I choose to love you. I choose to have mercy on you. My love is unconditional. It, it's not I love you if, it's I love you, period. And it's an unconditional love. And because our acceptance is not based on our performance, look what verse 16 says in Romans 9. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. One of the, uh, one of the verses that really meant a lot to me in my, my younger days, and what I use oftentimes when I'm trying to share Christ with other people, is from Titus 3.5. He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. And so God's love for you, God's salvation for you does not depend on your yearning or your exertion or your determination. It all depends on God's mercy. And our acceptance is based on our position in Christ. And that's what Romans 8.1 is all about. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. You know, that phrase there, in Christ, that I think was the Apostle Paul's Maybe it was his favorite phrase to describe uh, what a Christian is. 167 times in the New Testament it says, in Christ, we're in Christ. And uh, I, I, that's his word, I believe, for saying you're a Christian if you're in Christ. Uh, in Romans uh, 3.21, I didn't get this on your notes. It says, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been name, made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So I don't know if you've ever felt when you sin that somehow God is far away. You know, you feel like he's a million miles away. Those feelings are not from God. I, 
I'm, I don't necessarily have a bumper sticker mentality, but I've enjoyed some bumper stickers. But one I, I, I saw when I was back in college said this, if you feel far from God, guess who moved? Because God does not reject you even when you sin. You are in Christ. No matter what I do, he's never going to leave me. He'll never treat me as an enemy. Uh, that's why the Bible says we have peace with God. Uh, he'll always treat me as a son or a daughter. And the one, uh, one of the things that, that means is that I can live without condemnation. No matter what I do, God is not going to wipe me out. Uh, the second thing is this. God is not angry with me when I'm inconsistent. I don't know about you, but I get angry with myself. I get impatient with myself. But, but God doesn't. Uh, one, I think one of the most beautiful truths you can learn from Scripture is that God is patient with you. He understands that it takes time to grow. Uh, even when you're inconsistent, he does not condemn you. And that's what Paul's talking about. Struggling, you know, I, kind of, I don't know, my life sometimes spiritually has been a roller coaster up and down, but God isn't, it still isn't angry with me. Look, look at this, uh, this scripture here from uh, Psalm 103, uh, verses 13 and 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are but dust. And I think one of the things uh, that we have to realize is that, you know, God knows we're human beings. He, he knows exactly what we're made of. And I think one of the reasons that God never gets uptight or irritated or amazed uh, it, about things we do is because he made us and he knows what we're like. He knows what our weaknesses are and what our frailties are. And he knows our struggles with sin. He knows that we're not perfect. And by the way, I think that's good news. He, he's like a father. He has compassion on his children. And so, you know, when, when, when my kids first learned how to walk and they stumble and they fell and, you know, what did I do? I gave them a 30-minute lecture, and I spanked them, and I sent them to their room for an hour. No, no, I didn't do that. We pick them up, and we dust them off, and we correct them, and we help them get on the right track again. We don't scold them. They're babies. They're just learning to walk. And I think, likewise, God doesn't look at us and say, you blew it. You were so stupid. The Bible says, no, he knows your frame. He knows what you're like. He knows your mistakes because he made you. He knows everything about you. He knows what makes you tick. And as a result, I don't think God is either surprised or disappointed when we blow it. Why? Because in order to be disappointed with somebody, you've got to expect them to do something right. But since God already knows all the mistakes we're going to make tomorrow, next week, and all the sins that we're going to commit the rest of our life, I, I don't think he goes, oh, you're kidding me. Uh, it's not a surprise if you already know something. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why God isn't angry when you're inconsistent. And Jesus understands because he's been there too. That's why Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are with, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I think I learned that in our hour of need. But um, well, why does God not get uptight with us? I think one of the reasons is that Jesus has been there. He came to earth. He experienced the same temptations. He, he knew the hassles. He knows where we're coming from. And so when you come to Christ and you're in Christ, then you don't have to worry about, you know, that whenever you sin, that somehow you're going to have to hide from God. I, but by the way, I think that's a typical reaction. When we sin, we want to run from God instead of running to God. And, and yet running to God is how we get over sin. We usually, unfortunately, run in the opposite direction. So I hope that's a liberating truth uh, for you, to understand that God isn't mad at me because I'm in Christ. And I think the hardest lesson that I've had to learn as a Christian is the fact that God has not become impatient with me when I, when I fall or in, in some area over and over and over again. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, like I've committed this sin so many times, I'm embarrassed to ask forgiveness again. You know, I've committed that sin so many times, uh, 
surely God's going to say, not that one again. Uh, same old sins over and over. No, he, he understands uh, our temptation. And then number three, God doesn't punish me or us when we sin. Here's what punishment is. Punishment is payment for past sin. So why doesn't God punish us? Well, that's because of the law of double jeopardy. And that says this, that once you've been condemned or punished for a crime, you can't be convicted or condemned for that same crime again. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ took all that punishment, all my sins, everything that I'm, I'm ever going to commit, and he took that punishment for me 2,000 years ago. Now, why would God punish Jesus 2,000 years ago and then come and say, I don't think that was enough. I'm, 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 I'm going to do it to you too. Jesus took our punishment so that we don't have to be punished for our sins. Now, we are disciplined. And there's a big difference between discipline and punishment. Uh, look at Romans 5.18. There, consequently, just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, and that, that, that was one man, Adam, who blew it, and everybody else paid for the result. Sin came into the world, and we had a fallen nature. He says, so also the result of one act of righteousness, that would be Jesus, was justification that brings life for all men. So one man caused the problem. One man, Jesus, brought the solution by taking the penalty. And look at this verse in 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous, meaning Jesus, died for the unrighteous to bring you to God. So why would God punish Christians when Jesus Christ already took our punishment on the cross? I think that would be like saying, you know what? Jesus didn't do enough. And if you say that, that's blasphemy. That, that would be heresy. Uh, I, I love that hymn, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He took the punishment upon himself. God does not condemn me when I sin. God's not angry with me when I sin. And God does not punish me when I sin. Punishment is pain for the past. And your past has been paid for. So when we fail to understand this point, then I think we start, uh, if we don't understand, we think that somehow God is going to punish me and we expect it and we start looking for things, you know. Like, I, I think of an illustration here. Um, you get sick. God's getting back at me. You, you lose your job. God must be repaying me for the sin that I did 20 years ago. Uh, you have some financial difficulties. Uh, I'm getting payback. Uh, some people commit one thing 20 years ago, and then they spend the rest of their lives thinking that God is trying to get even with them. But God's not trying to get even with you. He already settled the score at the cross. And I think that's what it means to live under no condemnation. And if you're a Christian, your sins have already been paid for. God does not hold a grudge. You are not an enemy. You are his child. And this will affect your total lifestyle when you get what it means to live with no condemnation. Now, I, I would imagine some of you are probably thinking, oh boy. Bill's creating a license to sin. <laughs> no, I'm not. When I know God's going to accept me, whatever I do, then I'll do whatever I want to do. No, that's not true. Look at Psalm 103, verse 9. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Uh, if you got what you deserved, you wouldn't be here today. We'd all be dead. Uh, none of us deserve God's blessing. He will not repay us according to equation. And then it says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, uh, I, I heard my dad say years ago, why didn't he say as far as the north is from the south? Maybe because there's a north pole and there's a south pole, so there would be an end. But east to west is just going to go on forever and ever. And you can never be brought back into a conflict and, and condemnation with the, the, for those sins that you've committed. By the way, I wanted to just mention one verse, uh, and I'm 
I'm not trying to step. I think Joanne's going to, we're, we're going to go through First John here um, this summer. And uh, in fact, Danny's going to kick us off this Sunday. But, but uh, this, this is a verse that really intrigues me. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. And I love this verse from Hebrews 9, 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. So uh, now I guess the issue is why am I making such a big case out of all this? And I think the reason that I, I wanted to tackle this subject tonight is because uh, I've been talking to a couple people recently, uh, a distant family member, as a matter of fact, who uh, they feel like they can't get close to God, they can't enjoy fellowship, and they don't know why they, they, they don't love God because, because they're afraid of God. As a Christian, you don't have to be afraid of God. The fear that the Bible talks about is reverence or awe or respect. You don't call God uh, the big daddy in the sky. I, um, we don't treat God flippantly. You respect God, but you don't have to fear God. And all the punishment and the guilt, the shame, the penalty has been taken care of by Christ. And the Bible says that he has made us friends, his friends. And that's what it means to live without condemnation. So that raises the question. Here we go. What does happen when a Christian sins? And I think uh, if, if we have time at the end, I'll, we'll just go all the way to Romans 6.1. But he says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Uh, uh, if you're saved from all those things and God accepts you no matter what, and if you can't lose your salvation and God's not going to be angry with you, and if he'll be patient with your inconsistencies and he's going to go love you regardless. <coughs> so why not go on sinning? So we get more of that, more grace. Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? Uh, is how one translation says it. Um, every time we sin, God's grace is shown. So let's show God's grace a lot by really grossing him out. And then he'll really show his grace. Well, uh, I, I, I'm, I know most of you know that that's not true, but it, 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 uh, as far as God's acceptance is concerned, uh, there is a couple factors here that it will make a difference in what does happen. First of all, it makes a big difference in your daily happiness. It makes a big difference in your rewards in heaven. It makes a big difference in terms of your relationships and what happens with other people. It makes a, a difference in, in, in a lot of different ways. And I just want to kind of uh, take the last uh, 20 minutes to, to just talk about what difference does it make. Because every time you sin, your potential is reduced. So here's the question. What does happen when a Christian sins? If I'm not condemned, if God isn't angry with me, if I'm not rejected, if God's not impatient with me, if you're not frustrated, what does happen? And I want to suggest, and I, I'm not going to sh sure I have time to hit all six of these, but the first one is it brings conviction from God. And John 16, 8, it says when he, referring to the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And uh, so uh, that's that's one of the roles, the ministry of the, of the Holy Spirit. Conviction means that God is making you aware of your sin. And when you sin, I think God will make you aware of it. He's, he's not going to lay a big trip on you, a guilt trip. Uh, but I think he is going to say that was wrong. He's going to point out when you're wrong. He's not going to say you're worthless, you're no good, you're a bum, you have no value. He is going to say that was wrong. You know, in Acts chapter 2, after Peter gives this great uh, talk uh, at Pentecost there, it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And I think this is a clear example of conviction. 
I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon where you thought, was he reading my mail? Uh, was he peeking in our house this week? Uh, I have one guy in my former church used to come up and say, Bill, you're meddling, you're meddling. Uh, but I think we've all had a sermon where we felt like uh, uh, maybe we, the finger got pointed. And, uh, and a lot of times we've been cut to the heart and maybe even to the point, and I've done this uh, at times probably more when Danny's preaching than anybody, but I'm not living up to my potential. This is what I could be. And so how do you tell the difference? Well, first of all, Bill, that's because I put a picture of you on my desk while I'm preparing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So how do you tell the difference between condemnation and conviction? Well, condemnation says, I'm no good and I'll never be any good. But conviction says, what shall we do? Right there. Brothers, what shall we do? Conviction says, I'm going to change and be different. I'm going to ask God to work in my life. I want to be different. And I think one of the biggest problems I see with a lot of Christians is distinguishing the difference between the accusations of Satan and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and yet the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. So how do you tell the difference between when it's Satan and the Holy Spirit? And uh, I think uh, one rule of thumb here is that Satan usually speaks in general terms. You'll amount to nothing. You're lousy. I think the Holy Spirit gets pretty specific. Hey, that was a word of jealousy. I don't think you told the whole truth there. <laughs> He'll be specific about a specific sin in your life, and he'll point, point to that. I mean, think about this. Think of the difference between Peter and Judas. You know, Judas, uh, he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and he regretted it. <laughs> he was sorry. And he says, how will people know I'm sorry for what I've done? So he goes back, and he, he tries to give the money back. And they won't take it. He throws the money at their feet. They're laughing in his ears. And he runs out and he says, how will people know? I'm sorry. I'm the condom. I know I'll, he kills him. He hangs himself. And then you got the apostle Peter. You know, I will never desert you. Er, 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 er. you know. And I think there's nobody who felt more sorry for what they did than Judas did. I don't think there's nobody who felt more sorry than Peter did. But what's the difference between Judas and Peter? Does, does God, uh, you, know, you know, when the Bible says, come unto me all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I don't think he's talking about pregnant women and people carrying straw on their shoulders. I think he's saying all you who feel, who are guilt ridden, come unto me. And Peter, the difference is he has the, not the condemning of the unholy spirit, but the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And 60 days later, God used him to bring 3,000 people to the Lord. So the Holy Spirit, the di knowing the difference between condemnation and conviction. The second thing, real quickly here, is that sin hurts other people around us, usually the people closest to us. My sin hurts my wife, my kids. Uh, I, I could give you a lot of illustrations here, but we got to really roll here. But in the Old Testament, in First Chronicles 21, David uh, was told not to number the people of Israel. And he went ahead and did it. And as a result, there were 70,000 people who died from a plague. And look down at verse 16. Then David lifted up his eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven with his saw drawn in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. And then David and the elders, covered with sackcloth, fell on their faces. David said to God, is it not I who commanded to count the people? Indeed, I am the one who has sinned and done very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Oh, my Lord, please let your hand be against me and my father's household, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. But David's sin brought, brought uh, consequences to the children of Israel. Sin hurts people around us. And, and all of you can come up with your own pretty realistic illustrations about that within your own family situations. And then the other thing is that sin not only hurts others, it hurts us. And it destroys our happiness. You know, every sin I commit, 
every sin anybody else commits can be harmful to your body physically, it can be harmful to your emotions, and it can be harmful to your spirit. And Galatians 6, 7, um, move that verse up here, says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. And a lot of people want to go out and sow their wild oats, and then they pray for crop failure. Grace does not exempt you from the natural consequences of your own foolish mistakes. I could get drunk, go out in the freeway, and kill myself, and God would let it happen. The consequences, I, I, could, I could smoke and get lung cancer. And uh, even though I'm a Christian who's living under God's grace, I could become an alcoholic and ruin my liver. I could not exercise and not take care of my body and have those effects. You know, people, uh, one of the big things, unfortunately, was really misunderstood, I believe, was back when age first became a big thing. And, and uh, people used to say to me, well, that's God's judgment on homosexuality. No, it isn't. It, it's not a judgment. It's a consequence. And everything has a consequence in life, good and bad. If you do good things, I think you get good consequences. If you do bad things, you have bad consequences. And it's not, it's not judgment. It's just the natural consequences. What you sow, you reap. And, and so um, I could put on 150 extra pounds and have a heart attack. That's not judgment. That's just a natural reaction to my uh, poor decisions of eating. Everything you do in life has a consequence, good or bad. And so when we sin, although it doesn't change anything about our relationship with God, because he still loves us, he accepts us, he's not angry with us, he's very patient with us, he understands that I have an old nature, he understands the struggle. Uh, and that's why this verse is related back to what Paul said in chapter 7, there is now no condemnation. And I used to think the only way to get out of a struggle or out of the condemnation of, of, of what I was going through was if I stopped living a certain way, I won't, I, I, if I could get out of this struggle, I won't feel condemned. Uh, no, it says, even in the struggle, God doesn't condemn me. I have the conviction of God in my life. He's going to point out the things that are wrong. It will hurt other people when I sin. I'll hurt myself physically, emotionally, spiritually as a natural consequence. And then number four, fellowship is broken. You know, uh, there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. Uh, the relationship with God is not broken when you sin. You're still a Christian. You're still a child of God. But the fellowship is broken. You know, I could totally dishonor my parents, and I could lead a lifestyle that they totally disagree with, but the relationship will always be there. I can't be de Crawford it. I'll always be their child. I cannot be unborn. Uh, and a born again person cannot become unborn again. But the fellowship may be broken with my parents. It, it's very important that we understand the difference between approval and acceptance. Acceptance is not approval. You can accept a person and their lifestyle, even though, even as sinful as it might be, without approving their lifestyle. You can accept a person without saying, I agree with everything you're doing. No, God accepts you without giving a blanket approval of what you do. And so what happens is your fellowship is broken. Now, here's the good thing. Danny's going to hit on this probably on Sunday morning because we're starting a study on 1 John. And, and uh, so be sure to tune in on Sunday because I'm pretty sure he's going to talk about this fellowship aspect. But but let me just make one statement about it. How do you know that you have fellowship? Well, you have joy. If there's, if there's no joy in your life, there's probably not harmony with God. You know, David in Psalm 51, that's, that's his prayer of confession after his sin with Bathsheba. And he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. He didn't say restore my salvation. He had lost the joy of his salvation, and he had lost the fellowship with God, and he wanted that to be restored. And then the fifth thing is this. Your usefulness to God will be limited. I don't think that God will be able to use you effectively. You're going to be an unproductive Christian if you allow sin to pile up in your life. 
Danny's going to, I know, hit on this aspect too on Sunday. But here's a great verse from, from John 5, 4, 15, 4. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I think the next verse says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I always think about how much nothing do I do. So if you want to see fruit in your life, you have to be in tune with the Lord. You have to be in harmony. And you can't go out living any kind of lifestyle of sin. So because if you do it, then God can't use you. You can't bear fruit in your life. And if you let that sin pile up. So uh, we'll, we'll hear about that on Sunday. And then six, sin brings discipline from God. Uh, I think it's very important that we understand the difference between discipline and fellowship. And uh, I think it's going to make a difference about how we respond to God. Hebrews 12 uses the word punish in the new in the NIV in, in the word, um, or in the new American standard, he uses the word scourge. But in the Greek, the word is different. It's a different word than, than the word condemnation. He's, he's talking about discipline. So let's take a look at this in Hebrews 12. He says, And you have forgotten the word of encouragement, which is addressed to you as sons or daughters. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. That In the NIV, it says punishes. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. And what son is there with whom his father does not discipline? If you are without discipline, of which you have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. So we not, shall we not much uh, rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness in God. You know, when I was a kid, my dad never spanked the neighbor's kids. <laughs> But when I needed a little corrective action, he felt it was appropriate to correct me. And one of the ways I think you know if you're a Christian is when you start getting off track, God corrects you. In fact, if you see somebody who claims to be a Christian and they're living in blatant, obvious sin, and you see no correction and no discipline and no action of God in their life, I've always wondered if maybe they were really a Christian at all. Because one of the things that proves you're a Christian is you cannot sin and get away with it. You feel miserable. And the discipline from God is not to make you say, I'm lousy, I'm cruddy, I'm no good, God hates me. But the discipline of God, he says, our fathers discipline us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good that we may share his holiness. You know, Bruce Naramore, who was a psychologist back in my college days, uh, he made a distinction in one of his books about the difference between punishment and discipline. And he said the purpose of punishment is to pay back for wrong. You want to get even. You want to settle the score. But the purpose of discipline is to correct somebody and to promote growth. The purpose of punishment, he says, is to pay back a wrong. But the purpose of discipline is to correct. The focus of punishment, he says, is the past. You're going to pay for what you did, pay for how you hurt me, pay for your past. But the focus of discipline is always the future. Here's how you're going to change. Discipline is to help you to change, to help you be different for, for, for your future conduct. So what's the attitude behind these two things? Well, the attitude behind punishment, Naramore says, is righteous anger. God gets angry, but he doesn't get angry at Christians. There's a big difference. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day, it says. They are totally rejecting God's son who bled and died for them. And, and they would, that would make anybody angry, but God has done everything that he could to bring them into his family. How much more could, we, could he do? I mean, he sent his own son. 
He's angry at the person who continually rejects his claims and, and the stubborn self-will of somebody who says, I'm going to be my own God. So the focus behind discipline is love. That, that's, that's what he says here. God disciplines us because he's treating us as his own children. He loves us and he wants us to be better and he wants to correct us. So the result of punishment is fear and guilt and hostility, but the result of discipline is security. Um, years, years ago, I used to jokingly say my, my wife read all the books on, on uh, raising children, but I, I read a few myself. And uh, psychologists will tell you that the most insecure children are those who are undisciplined. Every kid needs to have parameters, kind of walls, uh, uh, boundaries. You can go this far and no farther. And what do you think immediately the kid does? He walks across the line. He steps across the line. And he wants to see if you care enough to do something about it. Who's in control here? And if those walls are continually pushed back so that there are no walls, no restrictions, no laws, then according to Naramore, the child becomes very insecure. And the most secure children with the highest self-esteem are those who are brought up in homes with loving discipline, not punishment, but discipline. And so there's the difference between punishing your kid and disciplining your kid is that a lot of times when you punish them, you do it out of anger. But discipline is sitting them down and saying, you're going to get this. I love you. And I want you to understand why because I want you to be different. So God is a great model for us parents. And then the last thing would be this. It's a loss of rewards in heaven. Uh, in, in 2 John 8, and by the way, I'm going to get to preach on 2 and 3 John later this summer, but uh, he says, watch out that you do not lose what you work for, but that you may be rewarded fully. And uh, so how do you lose your rewards? Uh, I think that anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teachings of Christ, and, and, uh, but whoever continues in the teaching, he goes on to say, and I didn't get this rest of this verse in here, has both the Father and the Son. And, and, but, and Danny, I know, is going to give us some background to, to John here, but there was, in the New Testament times, they had a group of people called Gnostics. And that was, that's a Greek word for knowledge. And they were people who said they accepted Jesus, but, uh, but we know more. And sure, it's Jesus Christ, but there's more to it. It's like adding something else into the Bible, another book. And so that Gnostic cult is still with us in many forms today. You have partial knowledge, but you need a little bit more. And I think he's talking about a cult that he says here uh, when he's writing to Christians, I don't want you to lose your reward. Don't get swept up in this cult who's trying to tell you that there's more to it. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, and I don't want to get too far into it, but have you ever thought about people who were started out as believers and end up in a, in a cult? Uh, do they lose their salvation? Uh, I, I'm... I'm I don't, I'm not, I don't want to start a new denomination about what I'm going to say here, but 2 John 8 says they lose their reward. And that's what happens, I think, when a Christian falls into a cult. They lose their reward. In 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15, and I'm not sure if I got this. No, I didn't get this on there. Uh, Paul, in the, in the previous verses here in, in 1 Corinthians 3, is talking about building our lives. And he says, by the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as an excellent builder. He talks about building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He says, if any man builds on this foundation, meaning Jesus, using gold and silver and costly stones and wood, hay, straw, hay and straw, his work, will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. So I think Paul is saying here on the judgment day, there's going to be a test. And uh, depending on what you build with, gold, silver, precious stones, or whether you build with wood, hay, or, or straw, the wood and hay and straw is going to burn up. And then in verse 14, he says, if what he has built passes the test, 
If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward, not salvation, but rewards. It, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Uh, I, I guess there's some people who will end up in heaven by the skin of their teeth. They don't have anything to show for their life, but they're Christian. And, uh, uh, and, and um, so and it, anything uh, that's a part of their life that isn't built on Christ is just going to burn up. And I think when a Christian sins, it doesn't necessarily change how God feels about you. I think he loves you. He's not mad at you. He wants you to come back. He doesn't want you to lose those rewards, but rewards are lost. So what should you do if you're a Christian and you sin? And I think, I think maybe uh, we should just leave this to, to Danny. And, um, and I'm, I, I had just had this sneaking feeling. I haven't really talked to him specifically about it, but I think that he's going to hit this whole aspect um, of uh, what do we do when we sin and how do we, how do we get restored? Let me just give you one last verse before we open up for questions. In 1 John 3, uh, 19, and by the way, this is for perfectionists, those who have very sensitive consciences. It says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth, how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. In other words, God wants your heart to be at rest in his presence, not in anxiety, not in tension, not in fear, but God wants you to be at rest in his presence. He doesn't want you to be afraid of him, if you're a believer, he wants you to be at rest in his presence. And then it goes on to say, whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. And even when I'm feeling put down because of my own heart and my own hangups, God is greater than my heart. And many Christians, I think, make, I think one of their mistakes is their own emotional hangups they take as the voice of God. I feel guilty, I'm bad, I'm useless. It must be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. No, it's not the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Even if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he does not condemn us. And I think what the Holy Spirit does is he prompts us to confess and to come to God and, and the unholy spirit condemns us to despair. Hebrews 9.14 says this, how much more then? With the blood of Christ, through whom the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from, from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. And I, I believe that God wants us all to serve God with a clear conscience. And when you do, uh, well, when you refuse to accept God's forgiveness, then you, my experience has been you refuse to forgive yourself. And then when you insist on continually condemning yourself, uh, then you're not living under grace. You're living under the law. And God doesn't motivate his children out of fear, manipulation, and guilt of punishment, or threat of rejection, or anger, or condemnation. He always responds to us out of love. Because we deserve it? No. But because we're in Christ. You know, I, I used to use an illustration uh, years ago when I was a youth minister. And I, I would take my Bible and I would take something like a, like this pen and I would put it inside of the, the Bible and I would close the Bible. And uh, uh, when you're in Christ... God looks down at you and he doesn't see your mistakes or your imperfections or your hangups. What he sees is Christ. He sees you in Christ. Christ is perfect. And for God to reject you, he'd have to reject Christ because you're in Christ. And I think that is the great news that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So. We'll stop there, and I think the natural pickup will be Sunday. I, I would imagine, huh, Danny? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> no. <laughs> no.
there'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of uh, similarities. There'll be a, a amplification of, of that. Okay. Hey, any uh, any thoughts or comments before we we close off tonight? guess I covered it. Oh, Linda. Oh, Linda, you're, are you talking? You're muted. I'll, I'll unmute her. Go ahead, Linda. Okay. In John 6, um, Jesus says that those that the Father has given him are his. So, I mean, I've had several discussions with people about losing your salvation. Uh-huh. And um, so, I, in fact, I did a survey of some uh -huh. chaplains and instructors. Um, and it was amazing to me that people said, yeah, you can. You can lose it. But when you said tonight, you talked about being in a cult. Yeah. I, that's um, pretty scary. But at the same time, if Jesus has claimed you, you are his. You mm -hmm. are his. Christ, and he's not going to let you go. Yeah, doesn't Hebrew say, no man can pluck you out of my, my hand? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Just asking. Yeah, no, I... There's a hard saying in 1 John 2 that we'll get to, that I don't know how much we'll, um, we'll get into it, but it talks about those that were part of us who came out from us, but were never really a part of us. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there is a possibility for people to be participating in a community of faith and not really know Christ. And at some point um, that uh, could play itself out in them going off the deep end, leaving the faith, leaving the faith or whatever. So um, there is that warning in first John two. Mm -hmm. Okay. But he's describing a, per, a particular kind of person who basically participates in the life of the community of faith, kind of, can, but never has really had a personal relationship with Christ. It's kind of like the Matthew seven. Um, we did X, Y, and Z in your name, and I said, "Depart from me, I never knew you." So right. the operating being in Christ, as Bill said, is the defining thing. Um, but it's, it's also possible to play the game of looking like you're part of the faith community or whatever without yeah. truly being in Christ. That's the, that's the opposite thing you have to consider, look at. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, if you are in Christ, I mean, is he's not going to let you go. No, no. Absolutely. If you're playing the game, yeah, then you're messed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Big time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, okay. how many how many times have you heard a testimony where somebody says, you know, I, 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 you know, I was 40 years old. I've been going to church and stuff like that. And but I'd never given my life to Christ. You know? And. Uh, so it's. Back in the promise keeper days, I think. There, oh, wow. Well, remember those. Yeah, we had we took a busload of about 40 guys from our church from. Uh, up in Wheaton down to Indianapolis and uh, I'm going to guess that about eight or nine of those guys accepted Christ for the first time and they've been going to the church for years mm. uh, so uh, yeah. what did they say that salvation is it's like 12 inches it's it's a difference of yeah 18 head, inches you, between your head and, and your, your heart. heart yeah no that's interesting Bill because uh the promise keepers thing, uh, out of that, which my husband went to, uh, came the heritage keepers, which was the women, which I got involved in. Mm. So, yeah, I miss those kind of things. Mm. Only in Indianapolis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you guys. Good okay, night. Okay, well, listen, let's have, a, let's have a closing prayer. Uh, okay. We're right at 8:30. I'm, I'm I'm amazed we got through all this, but I'm glad we did. So let's pray. Well, Father, first of all, I want to thank you for your word 
uh, there's liberating truths that we've looked at tonight. And I thank you that we don't have to kind of go around uh, fearing you. I thank you that uh, because of Christ, that we're in Christ, that you love us and you see us as perfect. You're disciplined, you discipline us rather than punish us. And so Lord, when we sin, help us not to be afraid to come to you and to face the facts and admit it. Mm -hmm. And help us to realize that you never get tired of forgiving us over and over and over again, but it only shows uh, your nature. Help us to live without condemnation the rest of this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, everybody. Good night. Uh, hey, uh, Darlene, before you go, I just want to say again, I'm, my heart just sank when I heard about Shadow. And I'm... Oh, uh, me too. I'm so, yeah. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And you'll be on, on my heart uh, the rest of this week. Okay. See you later. Bye, Lorna. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Daniel. Bye. Bye, Linda. Bye, good night, everyone.